Hi, plant friends. Welcome to episode 106 of Boom and Grow Radio. Hi, plant friends. I hope you have been enjoying these last couple of episodes of Bloom and Grow Radio. I've really been enjoying these chats. The more socially distanced we get, the nicer it has been to continually be connecting with different guests and also connecting with you guys. I've loved chatting with you on Instagram, via email, in the Patreon corner. It's so nice to hear you guys are all blooming and growing, and I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Plant friends, this episode is probably one of the highest requested episodes we've ever gotten for Bloom and Grow, Hoya 101. To be honest, it's been an episode that's been requested for a long time, but over the last three years, like, I've never really been into the whole Hoya craze. Like, I never really understood Hoya heads, really. A lot of my plant friends are crazy into Hoyas, and I just didn't really get it. But last year I was gifted a Hoya Compacta Variegata from a listener and it's like quadrupled in size. The pink new growth has been so dreamy and it looks like little tortellinis and I've become totally obsessed and it's definitely been my entry plant, my entry drug into the world of Hoyas. So when I was deciding on a guest for the show, I really knew I had to look no further than Doug Chamberlain, who is the man behind Vermont Hoyas. He's a bit of a legend in the Hoya community in the States and one of the most prolific Hoya collectors in the United States, if not the world, and he documents his whole collection on his blog and YouTube channel. And we are so lucky because he joined me for a really epic conversation where he shares his passion for Hoyas and so much information. We talk about where they grow in the wild, basic care, how he achieved the ideal humidity in his home, and we bust a bunch of Hoya myths that I'm really excited to dive into. And then the second half of the episode is super fun. He becomes a little bit of a Hoya matchmaker for us. He shares his top five Hoyas for beginners, three Hoyas for more advanced plant parents, and then he actually assigns the perfect Hoya for each of the plant parent personality profiles that I've made for my plant parent personality test. Definitely take it if you haven't yet. It's free on my website, and it pairs your personality with the perfect plants and projects for you. But Doug now also is going to add the perfect Hoya for you in this conversation. So you're going to hear a lot of intimidating Latin names, a lot of different species, but Doug provided amazing photos of all of the Hoyas that we talked about. So I've compiled them for you in two different ways. Number one, you can find them in the gallery on the blog associated with this episode. It's in the show notes. You can just click on it and open, look at the pictures as you listen along to the podcast. Or after you're done listening to the podcast today, you can head over to the Bloom and Grow YouTube show where I've actually worked with my video editor and longtime listener of the show, Chelsea, who has taken the matchmaking portion of this podcast episode and superimposed the images of the Hoyas on top of the audio. So as you go through the audio, the proper photo is actually going to come up. I also show you my Hoya Compacta Variegata on that little YouTube video. If you're interested, you can head over there. The link is in the show notes to see the visual companion for this podcast episode. I'm so thankful to Doug for how in-depth he went and how he's provided us these really rare photos that you really can't find on the internet sometimes. And I'm also super excited to do more fun and interactive clips of the podcast on YouTube, so make sure you're subscribed to both the podcast and the YouTube channel so we can bloom and grow to the largest ability. And special shout out to Chelsea, the video editor, who figured out how to make that happen. Speaking of thanks, I wanted to say thank you to our newest Patreon plant friends. The plant friends on Patreon support Bloom and Grow monetarily every month, and they make things like turning this podcast into a multimedia educational extravaganza possible. So our newest plant friends, thank you. And all of our Patreon plant friends, thank you. But the newbies are Amy Weininger, Michelle Sedlowski, Rhea Wood, and Southside Plants. Thank you guys so very much for supporting me as I try and get this podcast to every planty person in the universe. (laughs) Just blooming and growing, making the world a kinder and greener place. All right, plant friends, I'm a bit of a Hoya convert after this episode. I'm changed for the better. I've been thinking a lot about Hoyas, thinking and considering what my next Hoya purchase will be. So I don't want to keep you from the conversation anymore. Let's dive right in. I'm so excited to welcome our newest sponsor to the Bloom and Grow Radio sponsor partner family, Lovingly.com. 
If you haven't heard about Lovingly.com yet, I'm so excited to introduce you to them because they are the best place to buy flowers online because they match you with a community of real local florists across the U.S. and Canada. That's right. Lovingly is helping us support local planty businesses by pairing you with local florists, or they call them floral creatives, that create one-of-a-kind gorgeous bouquets based on your requests. So you can support local businesses while supporting whoever you're sending flowers to. It's a total win-win situation. Situation and I love this company. So Lovingly sent me the most gorgeous fall-inspired bouquet, which totally lifted my spirits. I love fall. I love a sunflower. I love a moody color palette. And I really do love my foliage houseplants plant friends, but there is something about the joy and brightness that a bouquet of blooms brings to a room. I've always brought home bouquets of flowers as my plant collection has grown, and I'm so happy to know about Lovingly to use them moving forward. The arrangement they sent me was custom made by Wild Orchid of Westchester, shout out, and it arrived in beautiful condition. You can check out my unboxing on my Instagram to see my gorgeous bouquet. And I liked the service so much, I actually paid it forward and sent a bouquet to Mama Fiella, and I was so impressed with the in-depth ordering experience on Lovingly.com. You don't just select a bouquet and send it. You tell the website your why behind sending the flowers and who you're sending them to and how you want the recipient to feel when receiving the flowers. Then the local florist that they pair you with uses their creative expertise to craft a custom bouquet just for the recipient. It's so special. And I sent Mama Fiella a bright and bountiful bouquet designed to make her feel important and appreciated. And I really thought it was so cool that they had the artist choice option so the floral designer can get totally creative with the arrangement. The experience was way more in-depth and personal than I've ever experienced before, and I've definitely sent many bouquets of flowers in my day. Lovingly is revolutionizing the way you order flowers, and I am here for it, plant friends. Let's be real, 2020 has been a bit rough. There's so many reasons to send flowers to family and friends, not only to console someone, but maybe to just encourage someone or uplift them, bring a smile to their face. So support local florists and make someone in your life feel loved at the same time by using Lovingly. So go to Lovingly.com and use code Bloom and Grow, all spelled out, at checkout for $9.99 off your order. Once again, that's go to Lovingly.com and use code Bloom and Grow at checkout for $9.99 off your order. All right, here's Doug. Hi, Doug. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. Hi, Maria. It's great to be here. I feel like I have a bit of a Hoya celebrity. I'm a little starstruck when getting to talk to you about Hoyas. You've made quite the name for yourself in the houseplant community. It's so hard to believe because when I started this about 15 years ago, I never thought in a million years that Hoyas were going to become that popular. I'm not really that big into social media. I don't even understand how most of it works. It just started Mm -hmm. with a YouTube video that I put out there showing a time-lapse video of one of my flowers opening, and that's how the whole thing started. I think that's part of your charm. I think that's why people like you so much because you're not affected by social media. You're just here to give us good content, good tips and tricks and understanding. It would be helpful if I had a little bit better understanding of it, but I'm going to retire in about six months and I decided that I'm going to learn how Instagram actually works. So at this point, I don't even understand how it works. (laughs) Well, you and I can have a conversation offline about that. I'll give you some tips. (laughs) Okay. So you are Vermont Hoyas the Hoya master. So you said you've been doing this for 15 years. How did you get into collecting Hoyas and plants? Where does your connection with plants begin? When I was a teenager, an uncle got me started in plants by just giving me a couple of African violets that he had raised. And I just got hooked on houseplants from that day when I was like 16 years old. And I've always had plants and I've gone through different plant phases begonias and African violets. And I was pretty much a foliage kind of uh, plant collector for a long time. And I picked up a Hoya, not even knowing that it flowered at a Home Depot. And it was about a three inch plant in a little tiny pot. And it grew and grew and grew. And then one day it actually flowered. And after that, I was just like totally hooked. And then I found out there were so many more different Hoya species. And that was the beginning. The flowers do seem to be the hook for a lot of people. When you see pictures of them, they look almost cartoon-esque. Yes. We're going to get into flowers later in the conversation, but it is wild. And I have to say, I'm going through my own Hoya awakening right now. I'd never had Hoyas. I never really understood 
I didn't really get them. I'm more of a typical tropical foliage, snake plant, monstera kind of gal. And last year, a listener sent gave me a cutting of a Hoya Compacta. It's called Hindu Rope, but I don't like using that name. It's Hoya Compacta Variegata. Yes. Is that what it is? That's right. And watching this plant, it was a tiny, I call it the tortellini plant. It was like two tortellinis tall. That's a great description. Yeah. I love Watching that. it grow. And now it's like eight tortellinis tall and <laughs> all of the new growth is pink. And watching this plant grow around itself in this very weird, compact shape has been really exciting. I just had another listener send me a very small cutting of a Hoya linearis. It's unbelievable that they're the same genus of plants because they look completely different. Totally. And then I'm very interested in using Hoya carii in my wedding. I'm getting married next year. Oh, excellent. So now I'm starting to get very curious about, I had started doing research about Hoya carii and I'm starting to understand everybody trellises their Hoyas and all of the different flowers have different smells. And they really are kind of, I feel like a one Hoya leads you to 40 Hoyas and people really start to take on and become really obsessed with them. So I'm excited to dig deep with you and develop I think our whole listener community's taste and excitement about Hoyas. So why don't we start off just with some general kind of Hoya history and understanding. So where do they grow outdoors? Primarily, majority of your Hoyas come from Southeast Asia. Many of those countries there have huge numbers of species. Australia, Papua New Guinea has tons of incredible Hoyas. Many of them have yet to even be discovered. So that's a uh, Hoya heaven there. And there's some other ones. There's a few in China, a few in India, but Southeast Asia has probably the biggest number of Hoya species. So those conditions, are there certain type of condition that all Hoyas grow in? Well, it's warm and humid. It's the tropics. That's what they really like. And many Hoyas are epiphytes or epiphytic. They can survive by just growing on uh, trunks of trees without actually even being attached to the ground. So that makes them a little bit challenging to grow, especially some of the more sensitive ones. Interesting. And why do you think that Hoyas are so special? Like, why do you think people get so crazy about them? And what turned you on about them? Well, it's hard to say. They're just indescribably beautiful. If you've ever seen a Hoya imperialis in full bloom with the flowers, they're like glass. They're just amazing. They just reflect all light. They're very difficult to get a good photo of because they're so reflective. They don't even look real. And the genus is just so diverse. We're talking about earlier Hoya linearis. It's just like, it doesn't look anything like Hoya carnosa or any of the other Hoyas. They're so different, so many different types. So yeah, you could be happy with nothing but Hoyas growing for your whole life. And it's incredible how popular they've become worldwide now. I just read this morning that one sold a couple months ago in New Zealand for $6,500 for a single plant. It's just like mind blowing. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. We're going to do a fun pairing of all the different plant parent personalities and your suggested Hoyas for them. But it makes me think of the curious collector plant parent, this profile that I have. If you're interested in going deep in one genus, I often recommend snake plants because there's so many different snake plants out there. But Hoya is a perfect thing too. I mean, like you said, you could easily have 60 different types of Hoya and not even scratch the surface of the availability. So I hear Hoya being referred to as wax plant a lot. So what's up with that? That early name comes from the fact that the leaves and the flower almost look like they were carved out of wax. It's that not really looking real kind of aspect about it. That's where the wax plant, that's where the name came from. And many of these Hoyas don't look real. They're just like they were created somehow in a wax factory. I have my Hoya compact next to me for this interview. And it is so weird to think that this plant with all of its curves and variegation and design like grows outdoors in nature. It is kind of unbelievably weird. It is. That's interesting because I kind of thought that maybe wax was because the leaves were kind of waxy looking. But then at the same time, there are some Hoyas that have thinner leaves like the other one I was talking about. So that's very interesting. Right. Okay. Any other like fun facts about Hoyas that you want to share with us or... 
Only when I was doing a little bit of research on this yesterday. I mean, I didn't even know this. I should have known it. But Hoya, the genus, was actually named after a man called Thomas Hoy in the early 18th century. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. He was a gardener to, I don't know, a duke or earl or something. And the person who discovered it named him after him. Wow. That's where Hoya got its name. Oh, I love that. So getting into care guides for these. So you said they're native to these really tropical, humid conditions. If they're epiphytic, that means some of them can maybe tolerate lower light, but they're all aiming to climb the trees to get to the big bright light scenarios. So can there be general care guidelines for all Hoyas in general? Well, probably 70 to 80 percent of them, you could use a general care guideline. Okay. Bright filtered light with water when the top half inch of the soil gets dry and as much humidity as you can have which, because that's the missing factor that the humidity when the humidity gets too low they just go into hibernation and they don't want to grow for you so this was my misfortune to fall in love with a high humidity loving plant when I live in Vermont and in the in winter, Vermont. Just, I know it doesn't work very well. And, and I make a lot of sacrifices and accommodations to try to create the conditions that my plants will like. So how do you set that up in your home? Well, I have several grow tents. I've copied a lot of marijuana growers, how they grow their pot inside the house and stuff. So I use a lot of grow tents with grow lights and I grow on trays of water in these tents. And I can pretty much duplicate the conditions that you're going to find in the tropics. And that's how I do so well with so many of these. Wow. You can get them up to a certain age and I adapt them and then I get them up into the windows. And many of them do quite well in the regular house. But there's some that will never do well in the regular house. And they've always got to be confined to artificial environment like that. Wow, that's really interesting. When you say that you grow on trays of water, do you have them in normal potting medium and then you sit the pots on a tray of water, like bottom watering almost, or are you growing them semi-hydroponically? No, they are on trays of water, but I have a grid. I use a closet-made shelving currently, and the closet-made shelving sits right on top of their boot trays, actually. And the water just provides passive humidity. I don't use humidifiers in the tent. Just all those trays of water just make the humidity in the tent get so high. And that's how I do it. So it just sits, it's like a humidity tray, basically, full of water, except there's lots of them. Gotcha. I was just going to say that's a classic houseplant hack is put your houseplants on a humidity tray, which is basically a tray with pebbles and you fill the water up to the top line of the pebbles. So you're like taking yeah. it to the next level in your grow tents. It's essentially that it's a very messy way to grow because every three or four months I have to do a tear down, a complete tear down because these trays get so disgusting. There's something about the LED lights that make blue green algae grow into new life forms in the bottoms of these trays. Oh wow. Yeah, it's really, really disgusting. I have to clean them out, scrub them out, use bleach and everything about every four months or so. What I do takes quite a lot of work. For the love of the Hoya. For the love of the Hoya, yes. <laughs> so Obviously, there are some varieties of Hoya that are only going to be able to thrive there. Let's talk about the varieties of Hoya that most houseplant parents are going to bring home from their plant shop, maybe even from a rare online shop, but that 80% that you said. So bright and direct light, can we put them in too much light? Can they tolerate bright light? Most of them are pretty adaptable. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that putting them in full sun all day is a good idea for most Hoyas. I destroyed a Hoya carii that way, got all blistered from too much sun. That isn't at my house. I don't have any windows where I have that luxury of having that much sun, but that was a, I took it to work and it was in a south window in the wintertime. And it's strange. It's all on the angle of the sun because in the wintertime, you get strong direct sun, but in the summertime, those windows, they almost don't get any. But yeah, you can go overboard 
with the sun, but some Hoyas can take it more than others. I've destroyed some really beautiful plants by putting them outside in greenhouses before I put a shade cloth on them and they get sunburned extremely easily, especially when they're not used to it. You have to build that up, Brad. Got it. And what does a sunburn look like for those of us who might not know? Oh, it's very sad. (laughs) They have these beautiful glossy leaves that were like showpieces before you put them out there and then they get all white, almost like blistered. And there's no coming back from that. The leaf is never going to look good again. So you basically destroyed the looks of your plant. Got it. Okay, cool. So bright and direct light, either if you've got a Southern window, my Hoya Compacta did fine in my Southern window, but I don't think it was as intense of light as I really had initially thought it was. A grow light would be a great option. I have it in under a grow light now. And then if you do have too much bright, like using a translucent kind of shade or curtain or something like that is a good bet. Or just sticking that it a foot away. That would definitely work. Yeah, sticking it a foot away from a windowsill. If I had to pick my favorite exposure for Hoyas, it would be the east window. Uh, yeah. I don't have the luxury of good east windows anymore. But when I did in my other house, they did phenomenally well better than I could ever achieve now because I just don't have those windows. Okay, cool. That's great. That's great to know. And then what about watering? Because we got a lot of listener questions, a lot of Patreon supporter questions that I can't wait to ask you at the end of the episode. But something that came up for a lot of people in our community was understanding watering. And if the rumor is true that you're supposed to let a Hoya dry out completely before you water it again. You need to find a happy middle ground between that and the way I am. I am a compulsive overwaterer, and I've paid the price many, many, many times, Mm -hmm. more times than I care to admit. So you have to find that happy medium between myself and letting that Hoya get so dry that the leaves get soft, because you can actually do damage on that end too, because those roots, you can dry them out too too far. And then when you re-wet it, the roots are essentially dead and then that material will rot. So you need to find that happy medium. And that happy medium is if the top inch or so is dry, but it's a little bit damp under that, that's the proper time to water it, not when it gets so dry that your leaves get soft. So if you're sticking your finger in the soil, at least that first knuckle. Yeah. Let it dry out for at least the first knuckle. But once you're starting to get into that second knuckle, first to second knuckle range, that's where it's really time. I mean, I have really small fingers, like hands, but that kind of the finger test is always helpful. It's very helpful. I still use that today. And another method I use is uh, I am a big one on hefting the pot to know what that pot weighs. That tells me more a lot of times that you develop a sense after time. That's another reason why I tend to use plastic pots because I know how light they are and I know what they weigh. Mm -hmm. As soon as I go into ceramic and beautiful, heavier pots, I can no longer use that method. I can't heft it and tell when it needs to be watered. So that completely throws me off. And it's also thrown me off whenever I've tried to fool with my potting mixes and use weird things like lots of like bonsai mixes and stuff that are heavy. Charcoal, because, yeah. yeah, it throws me off because the pot no longer weighs the same as what I'm used to. So then I can no longer tell and I have to guess. And when I have to guess, I invariably seem to guess wrong when to mm-hmm. water. And when you say hefty, you mean, this is something we talked about in a previous episode on watering. There's this practice that people use, and this really does come with time. I think it's really hard when you're first starting out to get it, but understand by picking up a pot when the soil is dry, what that feels like. And then once it's fully saturated, what that feels like. And if you spend enough time with your plants, you're going to start to just be able to pick it up and understand oh, this is bone dry. This needs a really thorough water or no, I'm going to wait three more days. That's exactly right. That is an art and that's exactly right. Yeah, it's an art that I'm still perfecting three years in. I feel like I'm a serial overwaterer and then I'm a serial underwaterer. Like I really oscillate because I think I overwater a plant too many times and then I really cut back and then I'm like depriving my plant. So I'm still finding my happy medium too. It depends what mood I'm in. Oh, yeah. 15 years in, I still swear I can't get it right. I just went through a big period of a lot of root rot just in the past couple of weeks. I've just discovered a whole bunch of them. I had to restart a whole bunch of plants. Really irritating. You would think after 15 years, I would 
have it down so that that wouldn't happen, but it still happens all the time. So I want to tell your listeners to not get discouraged. You just have to keep at it and keep at it and you'll get better and better at it over time. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Cause it's true. I think it's important to hear that people who have been at this, I've only been at this for three years. You've been at it for 15 years. It's nice to hear your openness about that. Cause I think perfect plant parenthood is never something anybody's going to achieve. And that wouldn't be fun. It's half the fun is figuring all this stuff out. With social media and, and videos and Instagram and all of that, you tend to always show your best foot forward and you always show how fantastic they look and how gorgeous these flowers are. But you lose the sight of the fact that there's many other failures on the way to get there, but you don't tend to want to broadcast it and highlight your failures. Absolutely. But it's part of the process. Another plant Hoya care myth I want to bust with you that a lot of our listeners in our community asked about, and that's whether or not Hoyas like to be pot bound. What's your take on that? There's many stories out there, people having their grandmother's Hoya that hasn't been transplanted in 20 years, and it's still doing fine. I am not a huge person for having a very pot bound Hoya. And I get tons of flowers. So I believe in a regular repotting of a Hoya. Once a Hoya is like mature, I think it should be repotted every, ideally, I would think every two years, three years on the outside and freshen up that soil. The plant will love you for it and just do that much better. But leaving a plant, a Hoya in a pot for years on end, after a while, your flowering is going to be diminished or totally go away. The plant won't grow the same as it did at one time. Every plant needs to have that soil refreshed periodically. When you say repot every couple of years, are you saying pot up into the next size pot or you're just saying take it out, refresh the soil and put it back? I've always up potted into the next size up. And you don't want to go too big with a Hoya that you need to keep it like another inch, inch and a half, two inches maximum bigger pot, because that's an invitation to root rot right there. You've got to keep it fairly close, just a little bit bigger than the last pot you use. Yeah. Maybe that's where the rumor comes from because they don't like to be overwatered. So people say, don't put it in too large of a pot where that's like a huge problem for people is they pot it too large and then the soil never dries out. So maybe that's where that whole thing came from. It is. That's a death sentence to Hoya. I've done it many times, like speak from experience. Sometimes you're tempted to go to too big of a pot because you want a trellis and to get a, a proper trellis into a little tiny pot is really hard. It's, it's very irritating. So what you tend to do is you get it into a pot that you can fit a nice trellis in, but the pot is too big. So then you're going to pay the price for that. And that's also happened. To me. Got it. Okay. So what about ideal growing media? Because I know there's all sorts of different Hoya mixes you can get out there. So what do you suggest? I got some really good advice from a woman back in the early days when I was doing this. I was very discouraged because I kept losing plants and the plants were the leaves were turning yellow and I couldn't figure out what the heck I was doing wrong. And she told me what she used for a mix. And I've pretty much been using that with slight variations ever since. And it seems to work the best. It's pretty simple. Just 50% of good quality peat-based potting mix and 25% perlite or sponge rock, and 25% fine to medium orchid bark. And that gives it that enough aeration and it can still retain enough moisture so that the plant does very well in it. I've always just used like a standard potting mix, this organic potting mix that I use, Espoma. But this year in the pandemic, I've started experimenting with adding, they have perlite. And now I feel like a little mad scientist, mm -hmm. like mixing perlite in. And I've heard many people suggest bark. So I've been adding orchid barks mix in and just kind of like seeing all the different combinations I could make. And it's been really fun and it's been really interesting, but I guess this mix is clearly all about aeration and all about letting those roots or letting the soil dry out. So you're saying it just needs to be really aerated. That's correct. Just it needs that additional aeration just so that the roots can get a little bit more oxygen. I fooled around with every mix known to man, but I end up keep coming back to pretty much that same soil. And a lot of people growing some really nice Hoyas now in, in semi-hydro, passive hydro. So I fool around with that a lot too, but I still, when it all is said and done, I come back to that original mix. Yeah, that's good to know. We 
We all know it, plant friends. Winter is coming, and that means lower light levels, colder months, and for many of us, this means that some of our plants might need a little supplemental lighting to stay happy. Enter Soltech Solutions. Soltech Solutions makes luxury, full-spectrum LED grow lights that look sleek and modern in our homes, all while giving our plants the highly precise photosynthetic spectrum and beautifully bright light to keep our plant babies thriving no matter what the deal is outside. That's right, no more weird purple hues that change the color of your entire apartment. None of that anymore. I found Soltech Solutions when I realized that my plant collection was growing, but my natural light was not, so I needed to bring some grow lights indoors that look sleek and didn't disrupt the vibe of our apartment while still creating some highlight opportunities for more plants. Now I have three of their pendant style lights hanging in my apartment. The pendant style lights are also called the aspect lights. They're in my home, in my corners, keeping my plants happy, and I actually macramed the cords to give them a little boho vibe. The aspects come in black and white and would seriously blend into any home. I can't say enough wonderful things about them and highly suggest pairing them with a tiered plant stand so you could get as many plants under that light as humanly possible. They also have their Highland track lighting system, which is the LED track light that's perfect for illuminating green walls, plants that are in hard to reach places, or even large plants that might need light from all sides. And listen up, plant friends, because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Soltech is gearing up to launch their first grow bulb in November. So that's just a light bulb that can screw into any light socket. And it's going to be epic. So you can sign up on their newsletter to make sure you stay up to date on the big release. You'll be the first to know if you sign up. The link is in the show notes. And in the meantime, if you want to snag one of their Aspect or Highland lights, you can get 20% off with code 20BLOOM, that's 20BLOOM, at SoltechSolutions.com. Once again, that's SoltechSolutions.com and code 20BLOOM, 20BLOOM, at checkout for 20% off. Okay, back to Doug. Kay from In Rooted Love, our friend actually introduced us. She's who facilitated this introduction to have this interview, but she was my guest for Semi-Hydro. She's completely converted me. I have six or seven plants of my 60 plant collection in Semi-Hydro. It's been a really fun experimentation for me. And um, she grows Hoyas very successfully semi-hydroponically. So if people want to go learn more about that, go visit Kay's page. She's got a ton Absolutely. of resources. Yeah. Okay. So... Let's talk about Hoya flowers because that's where all the goods are. Someone said the word peduncle to me the other day. And I was like, what the heck is a peduncle? But the first way it was referenced was in terms of Hoya. So can we kind of talk about what the peduncle is, how it evolves and flowers in general? A peduncle is a stalk that bears a flower or a fruit. I'm always getting taken to task on my videos because I'm always mispronouncing but it's peduncle. I've pronounced it many times using the internet now so that I can get it right because I'm always being taken to task. But yeah, it's very exciting to get that first peduncle on your plant. You think, oh, this is so awesome. I'm going to actually get to flower this. And it's true that you can get no flowers on a Hoya without a peduncle, but a peduncle doesn't necessarily mean that flowers are imminent. I've had some for years and I've never been able to get the darn things to bud up and flower. So interesting. while it's exciting, it's not necessarily you're going to get flowers uh, in a couple of months. So you'll have a bud, but you won't have it open into a flower. Yeah, well, see, the peduncle bears the buds. It's the little short stalk. Okay, it's a structure. Yeah, it's a structure that bears the flower. They're short. They vary anywhere from like a quarter of an inch to as long as 10 inches. It depends on the species. And then at the end of that peduncle, you're going to see some little tiny buds. And what you want them to do is have steady growth and begin to grow into buds. And then those buds will eventually open into flowers. And another frustrating thing is getting the peduncle and then what we call um, bud blast, where you get the buds and they're growing, then all of a sudden they'll yellow and fall off. That's fall off. That's really, really frustrating for a lot of Hoya growers. And it, it's happened to me on many, many occasions. And it's especially common if the first time a Hoya is going to flower. A lot of them are sensitive and then you'll lose those first few sets of buds. But after a while, they will come in and they'll develop and open. That was actually a listener question. Sarah asked, why do my peduncles fall off before they bloom? So is there anything you can do to avoid that? Or is that just like the maturity of a plant? 
that's your plant telling you you made a mistake basically okay. you did something wrong and it wasn't happy it didn't like it and all it takes is just like one wrong watering mistake you wrote water two days too soon or two days too late and sometimes that will happen you lose that but uncle well that's stressful <laughs> it's, it's very stressful <laughs> It's very stressful, especially on a plant you haven't flowered before, because those are the ones that you really want to get to flower. Yeah. Yeah. And then when that happens, it's like, yeah, it's really disheartening. But anyway, you get over it after a while. And when you have enough Hoyas, it doesn't bother you so much when that when that happens. <laughs> Got it. So what about getting the Hoyas to bloom? Are there tricks to forcing it to flower or setting it up to get it to flower abundantly? The most important thing is to make sure that your plant is happy. If it's growing actively and it looks good, it's going to eventually flower for you and probably sooner rather than later. And also depends on the species. Some some species of Hoyas flower very early, like within six months. And other ones, it takes six years. So it's very dependent on age. The, I find the toughest Hoyas for me to flower are ones that are day length specific. And that like really messes with me. And especially if you don't know that that particular Hoya is day length specific. Yeah. Like what does that even mean? (laughs) Some Hoyas will only flower when the days begin to lengthen, when the sun, when you get more hours of daylight in a day. Okay. And then other Hoyas will only flower when that day length is decreasing. Like as we're going into fall now and the days are getting shorter. And if you don't know that, like if you just grow primarily under lights, there are certain Hoyas that you will never, ever flower because it's just not possible because it will only flower as the day length is getting shorter. An example of that would be like Hoya Thompsonii likes to flower as the days are shortening. And most Hoyas, though, will flower the most is right in the early spring as the days are getting longer every day. That's the most Hoyas fall into that category. The ones that I have the most trouble with are the ones, the Hoyas that flower when the days get shorter, because that's hard to duplicate with lights. And it's giving me quite a lot of problems over the years. That's so interesting. And I still think that some Hoyas that I'm still unable to flower for one reason or another, I still attribute it probably to the fact that I can't get the day length correct. And I think that that might be it. You know, when you've tried everything and you still can't get it to flower, that's the only thing that's left. Yeah, I was going to say, like, how can you even figure out if your Hoya is one of those types of Hoyas? You can't unless somebody else has figured it out online. You do enough research and it's well known that that particular Hoya will only flower when the days are getting shorter or the days are getting longer. Other than that, you're kind of in the dark. So a lot of these new Hoyas, you just can't figure out how to flower. That could be the problem. Okay, got it. So for this 80% amount of Hoyas that we're talking about, the ones that most of us will have getting from the store. So a Hoya isn't going to flower until it reaches maturity. Once it's mature, is it normal to flower once a year? Is it normal to flower several times a spring? Like what should we kind of assume or expect? Great question. It all depends on the species. Okay. It really does. Some Hoyas will flower continuously throughout the year, given the right conditions. Certain Hoyas like Ovobata, for instance, I've only had the thing flower in the spring, spring, early, early summer as the days are getting longer. And then it doesn't flower the rest of the year. A lot of Australises, they only seem to flower six week period, maybe six, eight week period in the summer. So there are many Hoyas that don't flower year long. But if you can give the right conditions, certain ones like I can flower imperialis, which a lot of people would die to be able to flower. I can flower those things year round under lights in a grow tent. Wow. So it totally varies on the species. It's nice to have a Hoya that flowers many times during the year or for months on end, but there are many that just, they simply don't, they only flower at certain times of the year. Okay. That's good to know. Because I think a lot of people want to know if there's a hack to force it to flower. I wish there was. Yeah. I would be all over it if there you was. You would know it if there was. I would know it, yeah. 
So you have such an unbelievably wide array of Hoya knowledge. And I think you've also experienced a lot of different Hoyas that we might not know, but it sounds like there's a Hoya out there for everyone. So I was wondering if we could do several different types of Hoyas for several different types of people. For the absolute beginner, someone like me, I've only got this one Hoya Compacta and one Hoya Carii. Could you give us some suggestions for like five of the easiest Hoyas to care for in general? So ones that aren't too precious that if I have some bright indirect light, I will hopefully not kill. Okay. We have to start with your Carnosas, which are like the most popular Hoya. Yes. That was your grandmother's Hoya, basically. It's been around for years. They were really big in the 60s and 70s, and they fell out of favor, but they've come back big time. There's a lot of uh, variegated varieties now. There's a Crimson Queen and a Crimson Princess and a lot of different types. There's even one called Grey Ghost now which is like a almost silver leaf Hoya that they developed somehow. I don't know exactly how they did it, but those are pretty much foolproof Hoyas that will do well anywhere. And that's a Hoya that really does appreciate being on the drier side before you water it again. After that, I would go with a pubicalyx, which is it's kind of similar to Carnosa in a way, except they have much longer elongated leaves. They have silver flecks. They come in all kinds of shades of purples and pinks, the flowers, and to almost black. There was even a white one at one time. It was called the white dragon, but they took it out of that pubicalyx and made it its own species now. It's called Salata. So pubicalyx is a really a fail-proof boy. It's, it's a great, great plant, and they have colorful blooms, and they can just get covered in them. They're just lovely. I think that's the fun part about Hoyas, too, is there's the color variety. It's pretty amazing. It's truly amazing. Yeah, more so than our tropical foliage plants. The only color that really isn't represented well in Hoya flowers is blue. They're just not really a blue flower, but most of the other colors are represented in in Hoyas. Mm -hmm. The next Hoya I would pick as a foolproof Hoya has a shrubby growth habitat or it grows shrubby. It's Kumangiana. Okay. Never heard of that one. I always said that if I could only have one Hoya, it would be that one. Wow. It's been one of my longest Hoyas that I've had. I've had many specimens get to six feet high where, and I finally had to start them over and get rid of them. But they grow pretty rapidly. They can be shaped to trellises and things. That They have short internodes between the leaves. And they flower fairly early. And they get a spicy cinnamon-scented flower. So it's quite nice and very easy to grow. So I recommend that one highly. Readily available like on eBay for reasonable prices, unlike what a lot of stuff is going for today. So Mm -hmm. that's a good one. Everyone ought to have a Lacanosa. Okay. That's definitely a hanging plant. Can't be grown in any other kind of way. They have small leaves, kind of pointed. They get peduncles with about 15 to 20 little tiny white flowers on them, and they're very perfumed. So if you have a number of those open, your whole room will smell like perfume. It's oh, quite how beautiful. Cool. It's very, very nice. And then the last beginner plant, And a lot of these are even available in big box stores. A lot of times you can find them. So in nurseries... Especially Carnosa, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the others, La Canosa, a lot of times you'll lock onto a hanging basket of that. And this one here that I'm going to recommend is a species, they just changed the name. It used to be called DS70, but it's now species AFF Burtontonia. Okay. That's B-U-R-T-O-N-A-I-E. And it's a great Hoya. I always have this plant. It's very easy to grow and it will flower a lot even through the winter time. It's another hanging basket type Hoya and it has little red flowers that smell of caramel. (gasps) It's very nice. Some people think it smelled of like warm butter or caramel, but I have them in the bathroom and the whole bathroom will smell of caramel. It's very nice. Oh my God. I love it. We will have correct spelling and photos that you've provided in the show notes for this. So if people are curious to see what these are, they can go to the show notes and you guys can all go to the show notes and take a look because I've never certainly seen this AFF Bertonii, but I'm very interested to see your picture of it. Okay. So these are great. Carnosa, Publicalix, Cumingiana, Lacanosa, and the Bertonia as beginners. I'm going to order all of them. (laughs) 
So what about for our more advanced plant parents who have these basic plants? They probably already know how to trellis a Hoya. What are some more rare but successful Hoyas that like the 2.0 level Hoya people could try? Yeah, that's great. It, these The next ones I'm going to give you is perfect for that. They're not especially difficult at all. And a lot of people haven't heard of them. And I love them. I was just walking around the house the other day looking at my plants. And, and it's, yeah, these are definite must. Angle Rihanna Vietnam. I love this plant. It's a cascading hanging plant. It's the best way to describe it. It's just absolutely beautiful. It has really tiny leaves. They're fatter and thicker than linearis, but they're very small and they shoot out of the pot. They come out up and many, many stalks will come out of the base and it just like drapes over and they get white flowers with red coronas, red centers. And it's a lovely plant and most people don't have it. So I highly recommend that that plant. Okay. It's not going to be easy to find though, unfortunately, but mm -hmm. if you do, you have to pick it up. The other one is polystachia. I've had this plant now for probably 12, 13 years. It's a fantastic plant. It gets large scallop leaves. Like they can get eight inches long by six inches wide with deep scallops, highly glossy, just the outstanding specimen. It's not grown for the flowers, which are very nondescript. It's grown for those leaves. It's just fantastic. Love that plant a lot. The other one is... AFF Clemensiorum. This is one that I got from the little nursery in Australia quite a few years ago when they were still selling. And this is a really cool plant. It gets some of the coolest leaves in the plant world. They're 10 to 12 inches long, like daggers, very, very pointed. And they have raised venation across the whole thing. That It would be perfect like if you could only read Braille just touching the leaves would give you an incredible sensation because it's like braille. It's all raised. And they're foot long leaves, 12 yes. inches? Yes. Wow. How big is this look, plant? Well, the thing is, it's not an easy, quick grower. I might grow three, four leaves a year. Okay. It doesn't grow quickly, but it's a really, really cool way. It looks Jurassic. It doesn't look like it's anything from the world today that we know. So I highly recommend that. And I'll have to send you a photo of that. So Oh, absolutely. You can see what it is. Okay. So we've got some 1.0, 101 Hoyas, two, 201 Hoyas. Then I was thinking, I've got these five plant parent personalities. And I was wondering if you could pair a Hoya for each personality. So yes, I'd love to. We've got the mindful plant parent. So this is someone who likes to check in with their plants every day, maybe uses plants for mindfulness, likes to engage in them. So what would you suggest for that? I've got one that will keep them mindful for a long time. <laughs> I suggest Hoya Undulata. Okay. That Hoya there, will you can pamper it all day long. Ideally, you're going to have a room that's always at 75 degrees, and you're going to have that plant sitting on a heat mat, and you're going to have it under a clear cloak so that it holds the humidity in, and then you're going to pamper it, and then you're going to spend days just deciding, should I water this plant or should I not? And <laughs> if you make one little mistake, you're going to lose it. I love it. That's going to keep you busy for a long time. That's my best suggestion for the person who wants to spend a lot of time thinking about their plant. Okay. I love it. And then what about the low key plant parent who maybe travels, maybe has little kids, doesn't really have a lot of time to like attend to their plant, but really likes having plants in the home. What would you suggest for that? I've got the perfect Hoya for that person. And it almost made my list of the five easiest Hoyas to grow. It really is that easy. It's Hoya obovada. I really okay. like that plant. It's got beautiful, almost round leaves, succulent, two and a half to four inches in size. It flowers profusely in the spring. I had a lovely um, specimen of this, and then I no longer had room, and I gave it away. And it ended up in a hairdresser's shop on Main Street in Burlington here in Vermont. And still, when I walk by this today, five years later, that plant, and believe me, they don't give it any special care at all. That plant still looks really good, having never been transplanted or anything, just sitting there five years later. And it still flowers. So that's a perfect plant for the low-key plant parent. Oh, I love that. 
Now, the curious collector plant parent, I think any of the three you gave us for the advanced 201 would work. Someone who wants to really try something special. Do you have anything else you would suggest for them? Yeah, I've got another one. It's called Amicabilis, Hoya Amicabilis. And this is a fairly new introduction. And I like it because it was actually discovered on social media. That's how it got its name. The name comes from uh, Amicable, friendly. People were posting photos of this plant between themselves on Facebook, I think. And a botanist noticed it and discovered it as a new Hoya that had never been seen by the world. So yeah, that's how it got its name. It's really cool. It gets these little yellow bell-shaped flowers. So yeah, for the curious plant collector, that's my suggestion. There's a lot of other ones, but that's my one suggestion. Oh, I love that. Next up is the design-based plant parent. So this is someone who loves the aesthetic of plants, something with a special structure or a specially patterned leaf. So compacta is definitely up there. What else would you suggest? I would suggest any of the Finlayzoni type Hoyas. And those are Hoyas that there's a number of them that fall into this category. They're called the Finlayzoni type Hoya because Hoya Finlayzoni is similar to all these other ones like Callistophylla, Species Gundagatic, Species Mainam. There's a lot of them. They have very pronounced veination that are on light and dark backgrounds. So the leaves that have vein, and I mean, they're really beautiful in all kinds of geometric shape. So a large specimen of that can be really striking. And they're very hot in the Hoya world right now. All Hoyas are hot in the Hoya world right now. I know, right? Are Hoyas are yeah. just hot right now. They're hot everywhere. Apparently, it's the number one plant search word in the world right now. I just yeah. found that out too. So it's incredible. Yeah. So any of those would be great. It's okay. striking and different. Very different. I love that. And then my other personality is the urban farmer. but. I'm pretty sure, are any Hoyas edible? <laughs> That's going to be no. tough. I've sampled some of the nectar, which is very sweet out of a Hoya. But from everything I gather online, that the latex sap is very toxic. It's actually a toxic plant. Yeah, it's a toxic plant. It would not do to eat it. If you want to be an urban farmer and grow a plant just to for the cut flowers, though, I recommend Hoya imperialis, which I have put those in vases and they've held up very nicely and look quite beautiful for up to a week. So, oh, wow. So, why well, you can eat it? Maybe, too, a different aspect of Hoya is that mindful parents or farmers might like is the scent. I mean, the scent varies so much. So, what are some good flowers that have good scents that are easily like available to us to pick up? Well, the easiest that are available, the easiest to find would be the two that I've already mentioned, Lacanosa and okay. that AFF Bertentonia. Okay. Those you can find pretty much anywhere and they have beautiful scents. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to search a little harder and look on eBay, the Calicina, it has a intoxicating, strong perfume that will fill a whole house actually with beautiful perfume scent. And any of the like these, they're called verticulata type Hoyas. There's a lot of different ones and they almost all have powerful perfume scents. I had one at work and they actually made me remove it from the office because there were some people that couldn't breathe. They said it was too strong for them. So they really can get quite perfumed and quite strong. Oh, that's awesome. We've definitely talked about Ohoya for every person. One question I realized I didn't ask you was what about fertilizing when it comes to Hoyas? Is it normal fertilize Ahoya when I fertilize my other house plants like once or twice a month in the growing season? That's a good question. I never don't fertilize Ahoya. I fertilize okay. Ahoya with every watering. Okay. And maybe that has something to do with why I get so many more flowers than other people seem mm-hmm. to get. But I do flower. I fertilize every watering, probably half strength in the summertime and quarter strength in the wintertime. Maybe periodically, every two, three months, I might flush the plant with a, by putting it in the shower. But most of the time, I don't even bother with that. I'm always, always fertilizing. I never stop. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. I wanted to end with just a couple of listener questions. I can't believe almost an hour has gone by. So let's see. Okay. Katie Robinson wants to know, what are your propagation tips? Because she has had Ahoya trying to root in water for months and she hasn't seen any roots yet. 
Propagation, that's one of the most important things that you need to learn if you're really going to get into Hoyas because you not only can you share a plant with your friends and everything, but a lot of times the only way to save a plant that you brought yep. the roots out on. So <laughs> yep. that's the biggest reason you need to know how to propagate. For over a decade, I only propagated in one kind of way, and that was with a moist potting mix that I would insert the stem cutting into, and then I would put it on a heat mat, and then I would have it in some kind of a structure to hold in all the humidity. And when I didn't have that structure, I would even use a plastic bag. But a couple years ago, I decided to give water rooting a try, and I really haven't gone back because... Whereas the old method that I use, I would get like 85% success. With the water running method, I probably have 98% success. Wow. I always use that. And it's so much more convenient because you don't have to get all your stuff together and with the soil and bag it for humidity and all that. I just put it in the water. But I don't know if it makes a difference, but I use RO water or rainwater for my rooting purposes. And I put in a couple of drops of a product that I've used for years. I've always had very good luck with it. It's called KLN Concentrate. It's made by Dymo or Dynamo or something. Okay. But KLN Concentrate. I don't know really what's in it, but it seems to work. And I, I mean, I only add a couple of drops. So whether that's making a difference or not, I've never experimented by trying okay. just the water alone. That's what I do. And I get 98% success. And also it's in a warm, humid environment too. So it's not sitting on the kitchen counter. So I can't speak to that. So possibly that could be the reason why it's taking so long is it's just not warm and humid enough because mine I just go into my grow tents and I don't even think about it. And how long does it take yours to root in water? A couple of weeks, a month? Two to four weeks, four weeks Two on the outside. Weeks. Yep. Okay. So if you're at four weeks and you're still not seeing roots, start troubleshooting. Yes. Okay, cool. Cece Carson wants to know, can I get more pink vines on my Crimson Queen or is it totally random? It's pretty much random. And most of those pink vines, eventually they turn white and you wouldn't want to have nothing but pink vines because you need those green as well to provide the chlorophyll for the energy Mm -hmm. for the plant, because without that, the plant would quickly die back. So I think it's almost that plant was almost designed to have the right amount of pink vines. I know pink vines and red leaves are very hot in the Hoya world right now. And I'm always asked, how do I get my leaves so red on some of my plants? And actually, I'm trying to do the opposite because the red just means that they're really light stressed. They have too much light and they stop growing after a while when they're in that condition. So I'm always fighting that, but most people are trying to induce that. So So funny. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's like the whole variegation conversation. Exactly. Like, why yes. do you want a white leaf that's going to die? It has no ability to <laughs> photosynthesize. Yes. Kellers wants to know, she has a Hoya Ovada that has wrinkles and she keeps it in her eastern facing window and she waters it when it dries out. So why does she still have wrinkles? I'm thinking that she's probably underwatering that plant a little bit and she should probably water a couple days sooner and I think you would get rid of those wrinkled leaves. I've had that a few times but not very often since I've been keeping Hoya, especially since I tend to be on the other extreme of watering. So yeah, try watering a little bit more often. Okay. And let's see, one more question. Lex wants to know tips for stimulating leaf growth. That's another hard one. Some Hoyas will send out vines like seems like miles of vines and never and not want to put on any leaves but when the conditions become just right all of a sudden the leaves will just come out so it's hard to say and a lot of problems can always be traced back to the roots so maybe you should take that plant out of its pot and examine the roots and it never hurts to do that and then maybe hose off the old soil and and repot it and all of a sudden those leaves that are missing or slow growth can all of a sudden just pick right up after you've done that. Okay, cool. Well, man, what an amazing conversation. This is so fun. I feel like I'm going to go start sourcing all of these Hoyas. I definitely think I want to get one with a really nice smelling flower. You definitely have to. Well, Doug, thank you so much. You have the most amazing blog. So tell us where we can come find you. You have so much free information for us that's available. So where can everyone come follow you and learn from you and check out all your videos too? You can go to vermonthoyas.com. That'll bring me up or just Google Doug Hoyas and that'll pop it up. Um, I seem to be pretty well known now. 
And I have a YouTube channel that I never named anything properly. It should have been named Vermont Hoyers or something. But back when I put that first video up, the only thing I was interested in is showing a couple people my little plant video of seeing the flowers open. So it was just named after me. So it's just called Doug Chamberlain. If you search YouTube Doug Chamberlain, you'll find 400 Hoya videos on there. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes and check out the blog because Doug will share all of these photos so you can get better acquainted with all of the amazing species that we talked about today. Thank you, Doug, for all of this amazing information. What a treat it's been to talk to you. Thank you, Maria. It's been a lot of fun and I'll get those photos off to you. Awesome. Wow, plant friends. Was that not so epic? I hope it answered a lot of your Hoya questions. I hope it inspired you. I mean, I felt like every plant Doug mentioned I had never heard of before. I'm so thankful he shared those photos. For our reference, make sure to click the link to the blog in the show notes if you want to check those photos out or head over to the YouTube show to look at the photos that Doug is talking about. And let me know on Instagram what Hoyas you're loving and what Hoyas you might recommend to our community. You can head over to the Instagram post for this episode and and let us know, and maybe we can get some more suggestions going on in the comments of that Instagram post. Make sure to go check out Doug at vermonthoyas.com. Thank you to Soltech Solutions. I absolutely adore these luxury grow lights. If you're interested in getting one of their amazing grow lights, head to soltechsolutions.com and use code 20BLOOM for 20% off at checkout. Also, make sure to hop on their newsletter so you'll be one of the first people to know when they launch their grow bulb. And I'd love to end the podcast episode with a fun flower fact from Lovingly.com. So did you know that sunflowers represent constancy? Sunflowers happen to be one of my favorite flowers, and they were in the bouquet that Lovingly sent me. And constancy is actually one of my favorite traits of a friend, meaning always showing up, being the friend to bring you soup when you're sick, or be there for you when you're down. So if you've got a constant friend in your life, maybe you can send them a bouquet of sunflowers to say thanks and bring a huge smile to their face. So for $9.99 off your first order at Lovingly, head over to Lovingly.com and use the code Bloom and Grow at checkout, all spelled out, Bloom and Grow for $9.99 off your first purchase. Plan friends, I got to get back onto the internet to keep going down my Hoya war poll. <laughs> figuring out which Hoya will be the first one that I bring home when we move to our next place. I hope you're enjoying the fall weather. I hope you're staying sane in this cuckoo banana puffs time that our country is in and that you're using your plants to help manage your stress. And until next time, plant friends, I always hope that you keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friends, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you are subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're making sure you're subscribed, why don't you head on over to the review section of whatever podcast player you're tuning into and leave us a review. I would greatly appreciate it. If you are interested in more fun and educational planty content, well, plant friend, I've got a whole lot for you. Subscribe to the Bloom and Grow YouTube show, which is my YouTube channel where I bring you along for my personal plant journey, as well as share informational content that pairs with our podcast episodes. Follow me at Bloom and Grow Radio on Instagram for behind the scenes, sneak peeks at upcoming episodes, my daily planty lessons and thoughts, and most importantly, tune into my Instagram stories where I am constantly talking with you listeners and plant friends and polling you for content ideas and I'm always interested in seeing what you're loving these days on Instagram. Join the Bloom and Grow mailing list and get a free download of the Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print that she created exclusively for our community. And if you can, support Bloom and Grow Radio by becoming a plant friend on Patreon. For as little as $4 a month, you not only help me bring these planty and informative episodes to thousands of ears around the world, but you will also get the super secret planty password to our exclusive Bloom and Grow Radio Garden Club Facebook group, which is a wonderfully active group of plant friends of the Bloom and Grow Radio podcast who make up what I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. It is a lot of fun over there. And as always, my sweet plant friends, I am here for you. If you have ideas for episode topics, guests, or if you're possibly a business interested in sponsoring the show, reach out to me because I am here to help all of you keep blooming and keep growing.